would you breathe a word of prayer with me, please? Jesus, we really do love you. Help us to love you more. We've come tonight simply by your grace and your power made manifest in strength. I read earlier today, blessed is the man whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways to Zion. We've come tonight to say nobody has been better to us than you have. Nobody has been more faithful and true than you. In fact, you've given us what we do not deserve. You have protected us from what we did deserve. You've put hope in our hearts, songs in our spirits, swag in our steps. You have been good to us. Tonight, we come, I come, not to impress anybody, but to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But if you don't come in power, our gathering will have been in vain. And so I pray that you'd anoint these lips, that you will think with my mind and that you will grant my heart fire tonight so that we can be like Jacob who, when he got done, said, surely the Lord was in this place. I pray tonight, God, that you will grant me uh, simply to fix my eyes on Jesus, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And if I've asked you for too little, I pray that you do something even more than what I just asked you for. In Jesus' name, the people of God said together, amen. 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 Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Can I have a little more here and there? We ought to rejoice tonight and be glad in it. Anybody glad to be alive and in the house of God tonight? That's right. That's right. I am. Let me rush uh, to say thank you. Uh, it wouldn't, there are no terms of affection that, that I have right now to properly describe the love my family and I have for Bishop Clark and for Lady Cly, for the kindness, the generosity uh, that they have shown us. In the spirit realm, I, I think of him as a gentle giant. Um, if there were a kind of real game of thrones, he'd be the kingdom I'd want to be under. Watch him fight and wrestle. He's taken a licking, and he has yet stood firm and strong. And Bishop, uh, thank you for loving on me and my family, for taking my phone calls, for praying for us, and then for letting me come to the place I've been wanting to come to for a long time, to be here at the First Church of God uh, in Columbus. Thank you for your kindness to me. I know a lot of you have no idea who I am, and that's cool. You're wondering, can I preach? I'm wondering, can you pray? Because if you can pray where you're sitting, God will give me preaching from where I'm standing. Mark chapter 9, a word on my heart to be of encouragement to you tonight, is found at verse 14. I want to begin reading at verse 14 of Mark chapter 9. It's on page 1021 in my Bible. I don't know what page it's on of yours, but if you can get to Matthew, that's the first book of the New Testament. Mark is the second one, Mark chapter 9. And I particularly tonight uh, feel burdened to encourage church leaders. Uh, and so I pray that if you are in some form of service in your church, that this tonight will speak to you. Beginning at verse 14, the Bible says, when they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. Immediately when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? Or as the NIV has it, what are you arguing with them about? Verse 17 says, and one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought to you my son possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground. And he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out. 
and they could not do it. And he answered them and said, Oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him. When he saw him immediately, the spirit threw him into a convulsion. And falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. It is often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. <laughs> Immediately, the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. After crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out, and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up, and he got up. And when he came into the house, his disciples began questioning him privately. Jesus, why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. I want to lift uh, the thought for our message tonight straight from verse 19. And he answered them and said, oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long? Shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. I don't know what your him or it is. Which Jesus is saying, how long has this been going on? But my guess is some of you have been battling something for so long, it feels like you're never going to be free from the thing you've been battling with. It's a question of duration, but it's also a statement of desperation. I simply want to tag our time tonight, our exchange, the statement Jesus makes. I want to talk from thought. Bring him to me. From the thought, bring him to me. You may be seated. Whatever it is tonight, bring it. In small town Mount Vernon, Texas, the owner of the drum and bar and grill that was set to be constructed laid out plans before the city council to build his new tavern, a new bar. It was set in close proximity to a local church, and that church, having heard that Mr. Drummond received a permit to build this building, was rather concerned about the proliferation and influence of alcohol in its area. They did not want it around their children and around their families. So they did what any good church member does. They began to pray. They prayed that God would halt the erection and construction of the drum and bar and grill so as to keep alcohol and its influence from around the church. They prayed individually. They prayed in small groups. And, and then as the building started to come up, as the walls were there and the plumbing and electrical was being installed, they began to pray corporately in large group settings as a church. They prayed and they prayed. They, they prayed until one night, no small storm hit small town Mount Vernon, Texas, and lightning, curiously, if not providentially, struck the drum and bar and grill in mid-construction, got a hold of an electrical panel, and burned the building down to the ground in mid-construction. The church rejoiced that now this building would not be in its community and the influence of alcohol would not remain. And they shouted and they praised the Lord until they received the subpoena in the mail. Turns out that Mr. Drummond had heard about their prayer meetings and he decided to sue the church for praying that God would intervene on their behalf and therefore halt construction. It's a true story. They go to court, 
And in the preliminary hearings, Mr. Drummond's attorney stands up before the judge and says, my client is accusing this church of praying and their prayers are responsible for lightning striking his building and burning it down to the ground. To which the church's attorney replied, your honor, my clients say that their prayers had nothing to do with lightning striking this building and burning it down to the ground. In his preliminary remarks, the judge Riley commented, I don't know how I'm going to respond or rule in this case, but one thing is clear to me. The tavern owner believes in the power of prayer and the church does not. What a scathing indictment tonight for all of us who do not exercise the power of prayer. That's the tenor and thrust of this text tonight. Jesus, in essence, is saying that our problem with powerlessness here on earth is really our problem of prayerlessness here on earth. Prayer is the slender nerve that moves the omnipotent muscle of God. Prayer is what freshens the heart, gets God's attention, and causes him to move on planet Earth. Moses prayed, and waters that were laying down on the ground stood up on each other's back at attention and watched as the children of Israel walked through dry ground. Jericho, Joshua prayed at Jericho, and as they walked around those walls on that seventh day at that seventh time, he obeyed the command of God, blew the ram's horn, and the walls fell down flat. David prayed when he got caught up in that situation. You know that Bill Clinton situation where he was saying, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. And we all knew that he was lying, that, that he did. And right when God was going to exact punishment on David, David pray, prayed, Lord, have mercy. And he stayed the hand of God in his prayer. Jonah prayed one day in a curious space. He was in the belly of a fish, a kind of unlikely space for a wayward prophet. And he discovered that God can reroute your destiny and fulfill your assignment when you cry out in believing prayer. Hosea was praying. His wife kept walking out on him. And he had divorce papers in his back pocket. He was ready to give up. But God touched his heart and used him as an illustration of his wonderful power. Jeremiah had to be praying. He, he didn't have divorce papers. He had resignation papers. He was ready to give up on the church. He was writing a sermon and writing his resignation paper at the same time. But something got shut up in his bones, kind of like fire, and he wasn't able to, to give it out. And what can we say about... Haggai and Zephaniah and Zechariah and Malachi, except they all were praying. In fact, Paul prayed. He prayed three times that God would remove a thorn from his flesh, but God did not remove the thorn. He gave him something better than removing the thorn. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. Jesus prayed. He, he prayed one night in a garden until sweat blood like sweat fell from his brow until he surrendered into the ultimate will of God and he found courage not to run away from his assignment but to press through his assignment because there's something about the power of prayer and if Jesus had to pray what makes you think that you're going to get through ministry in these yet to be United States without calling on the name of the Lord let me rush to the thrust of this text. The problem in this text is the problem with many of us today is that we forget the real power available to us in prayer. And so we find ourselves unable to complete the assignment because we think that the power of God is controlled by us rather than realizing that we're controlled by the power of God. I think it was that almost cheerful time of year, 40 days before the Passion, many scholars suggest, when you overlap this text, Mark chapter 9 with Matthew 17, even when you look at the passage right in front of it, you see that this is an unusually bright, sunny 
day. Jesus is on top of a mountain at the beginning of this day. You can almost feel the gentle zephyrs blowing around Mount Hebron as he is up there with Peter, James, and John. And the Bible says he's transfigured before them. Uh, Metamorphs. It's the majesty of his divinity overtaking the mundaneness of his human personality. It's, it's the splendor of who he really is that has caused the simplicity of his human frame to sit down. In fact, Jesus had told them that they would see the glory of God coming real soon, and they see it now right there as Jesus is entertaining conversation with Moses and Elijah up at the top of the mountain. One of those disciples, the uh, impetuous one who often got his foot caught in his mouth, says, I know what we'll do. We'll rush down to the bottom of the Home Depot and Menards, gather all the wood we can and build three tabernacles right here to, to memorialize this moment when his hand is kind of slapped back by a voice from heaven that says, nobody asked you to do nothing for Moses and Elijah. This one is my son. I know you think Moses and Elijah are the quintessential prophets of the Old Testament, but they do not compare to the long-awaited one who is here. I know you got your heroes, but this one is better than a hero. This, This is my son. Keep your eyes on him. This is the one who I'm proud of. This is the one who has come to deliver. And watch this. While there is glory on top of the mountain, in the same day, At the same time, there is grief at the bottom of the mountain. There's a father struggling at his wit's end with his son possessed by a demon. Glory and grief in the same day. Glory and grief in close proximity. The best of times. And the worst of times in the same tension of moment. Friends, this is how life is lived for the Christian. We cannot lie to people and tell them that the moment you believe in God, it's going to be all glory. No, friends, walking with God is glory and grief at the same time. It's favor and frustration at the same time. It is the charisma of God. And the confusion of life at the same time. But I came to preach to some real people tonight who do not have everything going great for them or even everything going bad for them at the same moment, but who are walking a kind of melancholic life, who've got good and bad at the same time. The good news is Jesus is close. I came tonight to report that we have a Jesus who does not abandon us when life is high or when it is low. But when you feel confused and confounded and challenged, he is right there with you. He comes down, can't you see him, from the bottom of this mountain and there is an argument that is brewing. I, I know what's happened. I feel like from the context of this passage, These disciples have tried to exorcise this demon out of this boy, and they fail. This is the moment, Bishop, that the scribes have been waiting on. They've been waiting for the disciples of Jesus. No, let me say it truer to the text. They've been waiting to witness an impotent moment with Jesus so as to discredit his ministry. Because the old adage in the ancient time of this text was, so the master, so the messengers. You were only as good as the people who claim to follow you and here it is this father brought his son watch this the text says when he greets Jesus I brought my son to you but they could not fix him how many people are staying home on Sunday morning because they said I brought my problem to you But these people couldn't do nothing about it. You you may as well be honest with me. Finding fault people are with you and I. But because we could not do for them what they expected Jesus to do for them. Because the world cannot differentiate the person of Jesus from the work of his church. 
They are saying, we brought to you racism, but they couldn't fix it. We brought to you misogyny and sexism, but they couldn't fix it. We brought to you sexual abuse and scandals, but they were complicit in it. Can I tell y'all something? I am coming to learn not to confuse the impotence of the disciples with the omnipotence of the master. There is a big difference between the people who follow Jesus and Jesus himself. I come to church not because church people got it right. I believe in Jesus, not because the white evangelicals say that he's an NRA card-holding, blue-eyed, American flag-wearing white man from Texas, but I have come because I met the real brown-skinned Palestinian Jew who was born in a barn in Bethlehem. I'm not confused over who the representatives are. I want the real Jesus. And that's what people are asking for when they come to church. We like your buildings, but give us the real Jesus. We, we like your music, but give us the real Jesus. We're fascinated with your programs, but we need somebody who's got power. Do you want that, friends? No, I said, do you want that, friends? Do you want real power so that people change when they leave your company? That's what I want. Here is what Jesus says. He says, bring them to me. You will come to the point in your ministry where you realize you don't have the power to fix what's confronting you. You will come to the point where life breaks your heart. And although you're encouraging everybody else, you're depressed and sorrowful yourself. You will get there. But when you get there, let me tell you, when you get to rock bottom, there's a rock at the bottom. And his name is Jesus the Christ. You better meet him for yourself. <laughs> you see Jesus down here saying to his disciples, and to the scribes, it's a poignant question. It's, it's almost so subtly said that you could miss it. He says to them, what are y'all arguing about? I wish the church I grew up in had read this passage more closely. In the face of a dying child, the church people are arguing. Kids dying up and down the blocks. Close schools failing in our neighborhoods. M migrants lost without a way. And what we doing? Arguing. G Jesus says, what are y'all arguing? It's a rhetorical question. The kid is dying in America. We arguing over abortion. I ain't going to touch it with a tempo pole. Yes, I am. If we would but act like women were made in the image and likeness of God. If we would pay women a livable wage. If we would have functional educational systems and child care. If we would act like women were just as important as men, more women would not feel the need to have an abortion. We could eliminate the need for abortion altogether, but Jesus is looking at us going, what are y'all arguing? We got kids going to school, having to pick a pronoun before they even learn the parts of speech. And we arguing about stuff that should have been fixed hundreds of years ago. We could be building a fleet of Christian schools all around our country that would radically raise up our kids and affirm their ethnic identity. But instead, we down here arguing. It's historically true of American Christianity, right? Right when millions of people were being trafficked from Africa brought to the colonies, 
They were arguing over the finer points of heresy. So focused on doctrinal battles that they missed the dignity of human beings. It's as if Jesus is asking, what are y'all arguing about? decided I don't want to spend my ministry arguing. I want to see God do some things. I want to see him come in power and in force. And then we can argue after he fixes whatever he's done. How long has this been going on? How long am I going to put up with you? Do you see this, Father? This is a real dad. I can empathize in one sense with this father. I know no sweeter sound than the voices of my children. Sometimes calling out to me in the dark or in the night, Daddy, I jump up with swag in my step. Walk in that room and their fears subside. Just the sound of their voice move something in me. This father had not heard the sound of his son's voice. This, this son had not heard the voice of his father. He is pitched his tent somewhere between resignation and resilience. He is about to give up but do you see him saying, I'm going to give this one more try? He, he has heard about Jesus maybe feeding the 5,000. He's heard about Jesus healing the paralytic. He's gotten word that Jesus fixed Peter's mother-in-law's problem. He, he, has, he has gotten wind of the fact that Jesus has taken care of the man with the withered hand. He, he knows that, that even Jesus got a hold of that garrison demoniac and and, and then word bulletins have gone out that the disciples were on a stormy Galilean sea when Jesus calmed the waters and made the waves lick his hand like a mangy dog. He, he says, if I can just get to Jesus. And he gets to Jesus. And Jesus says, how long? Because I can feel the faith leaking out of you. I don't know where you are tonight, but my guess is it might not be a child, but it, it could be some situation that causes you to stiffen up. Anxiety comes upon us, and we get stiff. Some fear robbing you of your hope and your future, and you stiffen up. Some betrayal, some heartache still makes you foam at the mouth. You think about it and you get angry and you're not over it because it's got a hold of you. And Jesus says, how long? This man confesses, it's been so long. It's been so long, I don't know that there's any hope. I know that this is what he's saying because, because the text says that the man looks at Jesus and says, if you can do anything. Have, have mercy on us. J Jesus says, if. You got to love the subtle swagger of Jesus. Excuse me? If. You must not know who I am. All things. I, I tell our church from time to time, I, I go and, and I look up those words in the lexicon from time to time, pas, pas upon in the original language, each, every, all. And, and I'm here today to tell you, I got an amazing discovery on this word study. Do you know what this word means in the original language? All means all. <laughs> Whatever it is. He says, if you believe, all things are possible to them that believe. And the Father is more honest than many of us. He says, I do believe. 
but help the part of me that don't really believe. Because there are some things that come and get us in life for so long that it's hard to believe that anything's really going to change. Oh, yeah, I know I'm in this house tonight. I know I'm talking to somebody. You, you as faithful as they come, but you've been struggling with certain, you've been praying for something for so long. It's, you, you have just decided to keep praying, but you don't really believe. That it's going to change. Can I tell you, he through whom the worlds was framed can still step into your 32-year situation tonight and change it like it never happened. The Jesus we preach is not some casual cosmic landlord who's late collecting rent. But the Jesus we preach still has enough medicine in the hem of his garments, my mama used to say. That's more than all of the Walgreens and CVS in town. The Jesus that we preach is still able to speak to nothing and something can happen. The Jesus that we proclaim still is able to reach into your past and fix your not yet. The Jesus we preach still has all power in his hands. And the Jesus we preach has enough compassion to accept imperfect faith. This is the compassion of Jesus. This father says to him, I'm trying to bless you. If you'll hear me tonight, this father says to him, Jesus, I'm 85% the way there. There's 15% of me that's struggling. To get this. And Jesus says, just give me the faith you got. Just, just give me the faith you got. I, I, I know. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. I, I grew up at the Mount Calvary Baptist Church in Chicago, 1257 West 111th Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60643. Marcus Cox is going to be here tomorrow night. He's going to tell you about Emmanuel Baptist Church, 8301 South Damon. But I want y'all to get the real address of the church in Chicago to shake the preachers uh, to, tonight. And, and right next to the church, Bishop Clark, was the candy store. It was Mike and Deborah Gardner's candy store. And they, they sold this thing when I was growing up called penny candy. I, I, know, I know it's hard to believe it, but, but there were penny, pieces of candy that were sold for one penny. And it was a variety. They had all kind of Tootsie Rolls and Chews and Chico Sticks and, and uh, all of the, the kind of coconut chews and sugar daddies you could go in. And, and I, would, I would go in and I would count my money and I would see all of the candy that I wanted. And, and I would take all the candy that I wanted, and I would lay it on the counter. I never forget Miss Gardner. She's still alive today, sweetheart. She would put, plant, count out my candy, and, and she would say, all, all right, chocolate. Uh, that's what she called me. She said, all right, chocolate, uh, that'll be 50 cents. And I reach in my pocket, and it didn't matter how I moved that quarter and the nickel around. I could never make it equal 50 cents. And, and so I'd be standing there looking at looking at my hand and looking at her, and she say, she say, what you got? I, I, I say, oh, oh, Miss Garner, I, I got 30, I got 30 cents. And, and she say, is that all you got, chocolate? And, and, and I would say, Miss Garner, this is all I got. She say, just give me what you got, baby. Go ahead, take, take this candy. Come on in here, come on in here. Can I tell y'all in a higher, heavier, holier way? I have come before God needing something more than the amount of faith I had. I'm trying to tell you how I made it through a PhD program, how I got it through college without no money. I just brought them what I had. And maybe there's somebody who can testify with me tonight that you brought to God what you had and he worked with what you had. Is there anybody in this church tonight that says that problem that I could not solve, I brought them what I had and he made it work out for me. Is there some preacher tonight who can testify that the church is better than what you deserve because it didn't grow on your faith, but it grew by his grace. He will work with what you... Let me finish my sermon if I can. I'm sorry, I just want to get to the meat of it and I'm done. Jesus sees this demon and says, come out of him and don't come back. 
I wish I had time to do it the way I feel it in my heart. But I want to tell you tonight that Jesus can fix you from some stuff and it will never come back when he gets done. He, he got the kind of power where you don't have to limp and struggle for the rest of your life. You can lean on him. I know what I'm talking about. He can take some desires from you that seem to hold you down and they never come back again. The boy stiffens up and they say he dead. We was at June Buck's funeral last week. He looked just like that. He, he dead. And the Bible says, and I'm going to touch this, and then I'm going to end, and just the, Jesus picked him up by the hand. The boy came to life, and the disciples on a post-miracle meeting. They, they say, all right, now, Jesus, now that the cameras are gone, they, they got back to the house. They, they said, uh, Jesus, we appreciate you. You told us when you commissioned us to bless the houses that blessed us, to knock the dirt off of our feet for the towns that rejected us, that even the demonic forces would bend and move at our word. That didn't happen here. Why could we not drive it out? You see, friends, they struggle with the same thing you and I struggle with. The problem, the challenge with ministry is that you can learn how to do it. The challenge with preaching is that you can learn how to do it. You can get up without praying. You can study without falling on your knees. You can sing songs without ever having mouthed the word to God. You can come and go and nobody will ever know. Jesus says, the problem with y'all is that this kind of thing, it don't work with your power. You've had so much success that you run into failure. You see, rather than being dispensed by the power of God, they thought they dispensed the power of God. R rather than belonging to the power of God, they thought the power of God belonged to them. R r rather than being controlled by the power of God, they thought the power of God responded to their control. And they ran into a demon that didn't respect them. The demon only respected him. And because they were not connected to him in prayer, the demon didn't do nothing in front of them. Friends, what I'm trying today to tell you is that you will run into stuff in life that don't respect you. You better have a name that's bigger than your name. You better have some authority that's bigger than your authority. You better have somebody who got power to give power rather than somebody who just think they got power. Many of us tonight, I submit to you, are late for destiny, stuck on the side of the road because we've lost a passionate prayer life. Jesus says, this kind comes only by prayer. Prayer is not passive resignation, friends, to the tough realities of life. But prayer is the most potent revolution available to the church Prayer is how God gets his work done in the world. And the Bible says that even Jesus in Mark 1.35 got up early in the morning while it was still dark and went out to pray. That's how he did it, friends. I want you to notice, and I'm in my seat, how Jesus did it. The Bible says that Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up. 
Have you ever looked at in the New Testament the kind of amazing things Jesus does with his hands? You remember when that paralytic got let down through the roof and he put his hands on them. I'm trying to tell you, he got power in them hands. And that paralytic stopped being paralyzed and the same mat that was holding him, he started holding that mat because Jesus got power in those hands. You, you remember those two fish and those five cheddar bay biscuits from Red Lobster that, that the disciples brought to him and said, this is the best we got. And the Bible says he took them in his hands and he blessed it and he broke it and he fed the multitude because there's power in those hands. Y'all making me work too hard. It really does depend on whose hands it's in. You remember Peter's mother-in-law was sick and he came in and the Bible says he put his hands on her and that fever that was going to take her life dismissed. You, you remember when that widow woman stuck in grief was crying as her son's casket was coming by and he put his hands on the casket and the dead got up? Your hands and my hands got limited power. If you took some cornmeal and some avocado oil and some eggs and put it in my hand, I'd burn the kitchen down. But that same cornmeal and some hot water and some eggs and some salt and some avocado oil in my grandma's hands would make the meanest hot water cornbread you ever did have. Because it really does all depend on whose hands it's in. I, I've been trying to play golf with Bishop Horace Smith. He kicks my behind every time. I grab that five iron and I do the best I can. But when I swing, I sometimes have to yell out a word you never want to hear on the golf course. Oh! And people go ducking. But when you put that same golf club in the hands of Tiger Woods, he'll bring you six PGA championships. Because it all depends on who's hands it's in. I like basketball and I know I'm in the great state of Ohio and some of y'all think that LeBron James is the greatest that there ever was. We ain't going to argue about that tonight. But if you put a basketball in my hands, I might score you 12 points on a good night. But you put that same basketball in LeBron's hands and he will win you three or four NBA championships because it all depends on whose hands it's in. I started by asking y'all, have y'all ever noticed the great things that Jesus did with his hands? If you put some nails and some wood in my hands, I might build you a birdhouse or put you up a place somewhere where you could rest because that's the best that I can do. But you take that same wood and those same nails and you try them into the hands of Jesus, he'll save the world. I said, because it all depends on whose hands it's in. You got a problem that you cannot solve. I'm telling you to put it all in his hands. You got a divorce that's taking your peace. You ought to put it all in his hands. I put this and I put that. Whatever the problem he can handle it. That's a fact. I put it all in his hands. Is there anybody in this church tonight that says with me, you can put it in his hands? In fact, he's got the whole world in his hands. That's what they taught us growing up in church. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. Is it too big for you to handle? You ought to do it with me. Put it all in his hands. Yeah! 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 He's got power to straighten you lay down at night hadn't he got power to put peace in your heart hadn't he got power
to make you keep going when you feel like giving up bring it to Jesus put it in his hands the billows may roll the breakers may dash but if you put it in his hands he can handle it say yeah for you. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to carry something that you can't carry on your own. I know what it's like to build your house somewhere between resignation and resilience. I know what it's like to go to bed hoping that things get better. But I'm here tonight to tell you we got a Jesus who can take it by the hand. I want to pray for you, whoever you are. It's just so my heart. It's just so my heart to pray for you. Tell you that God is able. If that's you tonight, I'm not going to ask you to come or walk. I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand, wherever you are. Throw those hands up and surrender. You might want to throw them both up like that father and just say, hey, I, I believe, but, but help, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the only help and hope that we have, we come and we don't come shy, but we come bold. You said that all power in heaven and earth belong to you. You said that we could come before your throne boldly to get the grace and the mercy that we have need of. You, you who healed the sick, cast out the demons, raised the dead, walked on water, fed the multitude. You who hung, bled, and died, we come before you. I ask you on behalf of my sisters and my brothers to be gracious tonight. That problem that they cannot solve, 
the equation that just didn't make any sense. Would you fix it? And, and if you decide not to fix it right away, would you fix them? Would you give them the resolve tonight that you can handle it and you will handle it and that they can keep going in spite of their challenge and their frustration? I just believe that you're able to do it. And so I ask tonight that somebody would feel that wind blowing at their back. That somebody tonight would feel your comfort and your fire and your courage. That somebody tonight would experience your power to do even more than what I just asked. In the perfect, in the perfect and precious name of Jesus our Savior. The people of God said together, Amen. 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 My God, my God, my God. I don't think we ought to rush right out of that because I sense a moment where Jesus is getting ready to do something if we would just wait another moment. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief. But aren't you glad he'll take what you have? Give it to him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for renewed strength, restored joy. Thank you for revived spirit. Thank you for the release of favor. And thank you, God, that you are returning not just back to us, but you are returning us back to that place of intimacy with you. We receive the rebuke and the correction because some of us have learned how to do it. And that's the problem. We know how to chair the meeting of the ministry. We, we know how to organize. We know how to get the ushers ready. We know how to get the choir positioned. We know how to outline the lesson. We know how to write the sermon. But tonight, would you deliver us from what we know? And would you restore us back to our dependence on you? Mm. Take us back to those early days when we fasted to get a seven-minute message at the beginning of the service when we turned our plate down because we were part of a platform service. And now we run in revivals and preaching every Sunday and we tell God, catch me when you can. Remember those days when the pastor first appointed us over the ministry, we were so humbled, honored, and afraid that we bathed every decision before every meeting in prayer. And now we jump out the car and walk up in there as if we belong. Would you return us back to our place of utter dependence on you? Forgive us for our hubris, our arrogance, Give us and restore us and return us back to where not only we first met you, but first loved you and first trusted you. God, do it for us today. Do it for us tonight. In Jesus' name. And every honest heart who 
heard that word tonight from the preacher, you shout amen. Come on and give God praise. Woo, come on, give God praise.